Hi, and welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter, comedy showrunners. I'm joined today by Alan Yang, Ali Rushfield, Gerard Carmichael, Tanya Saracho, Bill Hader, and David Mandel. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. So there's an old adage, write what you know. Curious for you guys, what are the most personal things you've put into these shows and these characters? I named the dog after my dog. Mm-hmm. I like it. I did a joke uh, this year where Selena complains about why the New York Times covers modern dance so much that I'm very proud of. <laughs> because you've been very <laughs> they aware. they really, really do. I find they, they cover modern dance more than they cover the Yankees, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what are the pieces of, of you, of your history, that, that you're sort of mining for for laughs or, or for not? I mean, for more serious. One of my oldest friends, Raul Castillo, he's an actor. I, um, we worked on looking together, and I put him on the season. And um, he wanted a tattoo of Adelita, which is his mother's name, on the thing. And then when it was time to write his mother, it has to be named Adelita. So, like, it was this meta thing. I've known this guy since we were 14. We went to high school, college together. He's on my show now. And I'm casting his mother, too. That was, I, and I was, like, trying to get as close as I could without, like, you know. And it, But, yeah, so, like, it's very meta. Did you read his mom for it? No? Not a possibility? No. <laughs> I Her quote was too high. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And on TV. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had a show that I did. I don't know. I, like, talked about my dad's illegitimate kids and stuff. Were you nervous? <laughs> nah, not really. I feel like you should just be honest. Did uh, your dad react well? Oh, yeah. I mean, he reacted like a dad, you know, yeah. which has what? illegitimate kids. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, some the suppressed violence that, uh, you know, manifests itself uh, through Cowboys games. Uh, mm -hmm. That's you know, true. Dads. <laughs> My dad had a similar thing on the topic of dads on the last show I did on Master None. We did an episode where he uh, is dating two women at the same time. <laughs> like a 65 year old Asian man in Southern California, which is like a pretty rare story in television. And uh, he, we had lunch. We were like eating some seafood or something. And he was like, so I watched the second season, and uh, I noticed you had an episode where I'm dating two women at the same time. He's like, I don't do that. I was like, yeah, it's, it's fictionalized. It's a comedy. Yeah. Yeah, but, shouldn't uh, he be? Yeah. He, he should, should be, be stoked he should be, Yeah, he should, be stoked. he should be super stoked. He should, you know, get but you dance. know as you're writing that that you're probably going to be at dinner sitting across from him. I guess. I guess. And you well, just go for it. So for, for the show Forever, um, you know, we mind a lot of my co-creator Matt Hubbard's life because he's been married for years and years. That one you just did is, like, so fun. That one on the end's got more of a serious vibe. And that big one, that's the, that's the bad boy of the group. Yeah, I can see that. It's kind of like a James Dean you could put a salad in. Yeah. <laughs> you wanna go for a walk? Yes, but real quick. Hmm. Do you happen to know of a river that runs through Paris? The Seine. Are you sure? Because then that makes this suffalo wings. Uh, there's an argument between Maya Rudolph's character and Fred Armisen's character where for essentially 20 years he's been loading the dishwasher in a way that, <laughs> or she's been loading the dishwasher in a way Drives that she, crazy, that she yeah. didn't want to. <laughs> and, and, and basically it was just tines up, your forks oh. being tines up. And it was like, yeah, he's like, that's a real argument that me and my wife had and it got ugly. Uh -huh. <laughs> just about the direction you put your forks in the dishwasher. And probably so, uglier when, when you I saw, saw that. Oh, yeah. When I saw that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went, yup. And then I turned <laughs> I to my wife and also we had a discussion about where you cut the butter oh, on a God. stick of butter. Wait, up. I, I cut up. a slice of butter. Yeah. She like scapes the top of oh. the butter like, I don't know. Like, You're I'm right. not, like she's an alien. You're I don't know what's happening. We'll talk afterwards whether you should remain married after that. But you put the fork up so that it gets up. Cleaned better. Yes. But you put a knife down in case someone trips and falls on the knife. Yes. Well, it seems like all of us could be married. <laughs> because we all agree those are the rational things to do. Oh, okay. uh, so Bill, what about you? Uh, well, my show's about a murderer, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember reading that your sister no. found their pieces of, of your past that she was surprised. Yeah, and I mean, showed. I think there's also, with that character... And like what you were saying is you try to be as honest as you can, and especially, I don't know how you guys are in the writer's rooms, but sometimes it could feel like group therapy where those writer's rooms are so, could get so personal. I, I find like I'll share things in the writer's room that I've never shared with like closest friends because yeah. you're trying to get to some truth about something. Mm -hmm. So you just start, 
you know, talking about like, yeah, man, I remember like in, you know, ninth grade just feeling like an utter failure and I would just cry a lot, just like start crying and not knowing what, and everybody going, all right, Bill. Okay. And my, <laughs> my best friend Duffy Boudreaux writes on the show and he's been friends with me since we were 13. He's like, I didn't know any of this stuff. Are you okay? <laughs> but um, you just try to find that Venn diagram of your main character and you in the room, you know, you just try to pull people and stuff. The idea of wanting a community, wanting like, acceptance. There's a scene in the pilot of Barry where he's sitting there with all these actors. He's looking at them and that's me my first season on Saturday Night Live. That's me being with Amy Poehler and Maya Rudolph and Fred and everybody just going, I so badly want to be accepted by these people, but I feel I, I don't have the skills mm -hmm. at all. And they're speaking a totally different language than me, you know. And so it's taking that emotion and instead of making a show about a guy getting on SNL, which people I don't think we really care about. I don't know, but I don't maybe. They only tried to make two shows about it in the early 2000s. Yeah, they only did two. And the good one got, you know, no, I'm You know, Alec and I talked a lot about stakes, you know, and I think, you know, in comedy, and you just go, well, can we do a show about death, you know, life and death, you know, and still be funny, you know? So I guess my point is you take those those things from your life, but you could put it into a genre type thing if you wanted to. What if I train your guys? They already have physical training, right? They have like three. Not at a gym, I'm talking about, I I'm a Marine, all right? I could teach them how to shoot, combat skills. I don't have to kill any more, debt paid. You would give me on me. You would turn these pumpkins into Cinderella's overnight, huh? I could take over Burmese Mafia, go back to 50-50 with Crystal Ball. Or you could just take the whole thing for yourself. 50-50 with Crystal Ball, I like the sound of that. We were in the room and I was, it was just Lindy and AD who mm -hmm. created it with me. And we were talking about something about the mother character. And I told this thing of my mother saying like, to me when I was upset once, like you're never alone. And they were like, oh, that's so sweet. Okay, we need to do that, but just not as on the nose as that. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's my life. <laughs> that's my <laughs> that's my mother. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole thing with a laptop in season one where I get the girl I like a laptop and she goes, that's too nice of a present. And Alec Berg and I actually thought that was a nice present and all the women in the writer's room were like, no, that's too super much. creepy, that's way too much. A laptop? A laptop like after. early in a relationship? Like we've hung out once. Oh yeah, that's, oh. that's creepy. And I was like, I <laughs> dated someone once and I got them an iPod. They were totally creeped out. And I remembered <laughs> about it, you know what I mean? It was like, oh yeah. Oh no! Yeah, I've done it's a little spot. I like it. Creepy? Yes. Yes, it is. Allow me to creepy. With all due respect, if it came from a man in a cashmere hoodie, I'm like, oh, I get it. Like, yeah, yeah, a laptop makes sense. Like in context, it, get, it didn't it's get what you buy. It feels like a transaction. That's why, you know. That's why oh, yeah, it feels yeah. like. I didn't know. Why am I supposed I to do said, for this? She laptop. said that it was a Tony Soprano move. I, mean, like a I didn't realize it was that many ungrateful people. Oh God, there like are some people who come up to me and been like, I would have taken that one. Of course. Oh, <laughs> yeah. of course. I know, I have six cousins off the top of my head who would marry you after that. And it's creepy. All right, so when was the last time as you guys were writing that you or your collaborators were a little nervous? Just for the things you're going to tackle. Stars pitched me the show. They just said we want a show about gentrification, not gentrification, but gentrification of a Latinx space by another upwardly mobile Latinx, um, East LA millennial female. And then after that, that was it. That the, the they, you know go. That um, looks like the trending page on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was like do this. Um, so that's I picked, every word. Yeah. That was it. We have six months, Lynn. I have enough to keep us going for six months. That's not bad. No, that's fucking terrifying. That's without you and me making a penny. You should be scared shitless. We're gonna have to buck the fuck up if this is gonna work. I'm ready to buck. I put the queerness in there to have a, you know, a bit of me. I put, um, Brujas, because I practice brujería, <laughs> I practice witchcraft. Like, I was like, how am I going to get in here, you know? Um, the queerness, then we wanted to do it right. And there was this one scene, first season, that a non-binary person and a femme top are having sex. That already is, we haven't seen that, right? And I was like, and we, I have a mostly queer, all Latinx writer's room. 
we were like, we have to get this right because we've never seen a non-binary person with breasts have sex with a femme top. And like, what does that mean? And we workshopped that thing. People would be like, well, like sort of like pitched how I've done it, you know, like, mm-hmm. it, and it, but, it, but it was so like, the responsibility was felt so hardcore, you know, cause like, it was like, we've never seen that. And also we've never seen brown queers mm-hmm. do that. It was workshop to death. Like you see writers, hanging onto the door frame, being like, see, she could get eaten this way. <laughs> and she could, sorry, I'm not say that. She could, like, everybody was just like, no, no, because, like, whatever. It was, uh, and then who we cast was so important. The person needs to be gender non-conforming to, like, all, all of it was so, but then it turned out fine. <laughs> what about the rest of you? Is there anyone that comes to mind? We had on the first episode an abortion. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, like, obviously purposeful to have it in the first episode. I don't think anyone was nervous about it, but like when I wrote the draft of that, the actual abortion scene, I kept making it a comedy scene. And then the people I wrote it with kept taking out the comedy stuff. Why was it important for you to have it sort of I just thought it would be funny if she was like talking about like, is this like removing a mole or like killing a fly or like (laughs) like asking the woman doing the procedure all these like nervous questions and they were like you're you're taking every bit of dignity out of this moment. <laughs> Who won the battle? They did. <laughs> it I was like si- it was really handled. silent, and it was someone explaining the. Pr- it was yeah. less like clinical. It wasn't a comedy scene. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to brag, but our abortion scene was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As far uh, as abortion scenes, uh, I kept try- I kept being like, we could have it, do a take where she says my jokes, and they were just like. I really no. liked how it was handled. Oh, I thank loved you. it. <laughs> you know, Gerard, you're, I remember a few years ago when you were working on your show, mm-hmm. you talked about sort of your frustration with these sort of network notes of, of wanting characters to be likable. Yeah. I am curious now that you are on a streaming platform, what have you been able to do with the Rami character or others in the show that you wouldn't have been able to get away with on network television? What I realized, it's not necessarily just network notes, it's also like within like writers rooms, like I, I love a lot of like the writers I work with. I, I don't like writers rooms uh, like at all. I, it's like terrible for comedy, <laughs> like in both film and television, like the round table punch ups and shit, like ruin movies. I've seen it happen like dozens of times. And it's because everyone is, starts telling jokes to each other and then you get caught away. Like you, the emotion could go away. Yeah. Not saying I didn't, you know, I love them all as individuals, sure. but it's, as a concept, it's it's terrible. I agree but disagree. I, I actually don't mind a writer's room for punch-up, for making something funnier yeah. when you are trying to make something funny. I mean, I will say that. Mm-hmm. And obviously it requires somebody to be running it to make sure that yeah. if you are doing something that maybe doesn't need to be funny or that there is emotion, that somebody is paying attention to those things. But I think the part for me that certainly resonates is the notion of shows being written completely in a room from scratch yeah. the mm-hmm. sort yeah. of the the more standard if you will network sitcom version of like we're all going to be in a room and we're all going to pitch it and then it's your turn to write or it's your yeah. turn to write yeah, it's or it's your specific. turn to write it has to be specific and it dri- that's, that, that's the thing that drives me crazy and i say it all the time and people are like no you don't understand i'm like no you don't understand <laughs> yeah. and all i can say is at least the shows i've been lucky enough to work on like on that's how larry and jerry did on seinfeld that's how they taught us which is yeah. We're not writing in a room. We might make it better in a room later, but your episode is your episode, and your episode is your episode. That is how you can at least preserve original voice, or write it yourself. I mean, I know you guys did a lot of that, too. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. I think what we're all talking about is kind of just point of view, right? It's like, it's Mm -hmm. the best shows, the best films in history have a very singular, clear, unique, usually unheard of point of view, like a new point of view, and whether that's comedic, dramatic, whatever, but the thing that drives me crazy when watching something is when it feels like it's written by a committee, when it feels like it's cobbled together, when it feels like every line was written by a writer. If, if that makes sense, you know what yeah. I mean? It just It's like no one's to talking me, like, about it. sometimes feel that where you go, I do a joke, it's so shitty, but you're like, oh, like, hey, my joke got in. Like, yeah, was, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Because you, can see, just, you can kind of yeah. feel it on yeah. a show Or sometime. you could feel that it's like, 
Oh, that was done at three in the morning. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's those, I always call them, yeah, on it's that the bed. non-jokes, it's the yeah. joke-like yeah. substances mm -hmm. that yeah. sort yeah. of make it mm -hmm. in where you can go, I see how everyone thought that was very amusing <laughs> at 11.30 yeah, p.m. Yeah. Yeah. But well, it has but a it's rhythm. Not. It's like yes. all rhythm. Exactly. It's all yeah. rhythm. It's like, I have like a little, I have little daughters and my four-year-old sometimes play TV and she, it's just all rhythm. She's like saying nothing, but she's going, I'm a guy there, I'm a guy there, you know what I mean? And it's like laughs. Yeah, it's like your, shit. Crackle just gave your daughter a deal, right? No, no, she's got Crackle. Two hundred million dollars? She's got, you have no idea. She's making me some money. This may be a natural segue, but what did the sort of, the network versions of your show look like? No abortion. Uh, <laughs> no abortion. No abortion. Yeah, no abortion. We did realistic. pitch it to a network, and they were like, "We would, we would put this abortion on TV." And we were like, "No, you wouldn't. No. Like, you might no. say that, no, but they you won't. Wouldn't. No. Yeah. no, they Here's wouldn't. Yeah, no. Here's the thing. Truthfully, it's not that network can't have it because I, I look at my show as an experiment. I smoked weed twice on my show. I said nigga six times in one episode. My grandmother actually killed herself on camera by taking pills, oh and we God. watched her die. We did all of that on NBC, <laughs> you know, like on NBC on Wednesday nights, right? And what happens, truthfully, uh, writers limit themselves. They inhibit themselves. You were talking about, like, those deep conversations that happen in writers' room. I've seen versions of that, like, where it happens in the room, and then none of it makes its way yeah. to the page. Well, and and everyone censors themselves, and yeah. everyone yeah. freaks people out freak because out. you have a mortgage and a private school yeah. tuition. Well, it's not just everyone... that. I think people do get raised in those systems. Yeah. yeah. Being a oh, that company. It, it's yeah. a bunch yeah. of yeah. company like, men that's and women how you, that, you like, yeah, that's how you by work. By yeah. listening and taking every note you've ever people heard. People are fucking yeah. terrified. Writers are terrified. You can do anything on any platform that you want to do. You can absolutely do it. You can get away with it. We've regressed. If you really look at comedy, you look at it from the standpoint of like the 90s, and you look at things that In Living Color was doing, Roseanne was doing, mm. like you look at like the boundaries they genuinely pushed, as opposed to now, like we self applaud so when someone attacks Trump again, as <laughs> if it, one, it's not an echo chamber or as if it matters. And like people do the same thing and we applaud and we pretend that it's edgy and we pretend that it's going again, but it's changed. Like, People have, are like they're afraid, and everyone's like preaches to their respective choir, and you know I don't know. But okay, you know, comedy's fun though. It's funny. <laughs> the networks always feel like they're willing to push. I mean, I don't disagree about writers sort of self-generating the, the 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 limits, but it is funny. Like I feel like they know what they're looking for, or at least maybe can be a little more adventurous on the drama side, and yet when it comes to comedy, they are looking for I don't know, like right down the down middle a little yeah. more. Everyone yeah. sounds like a virgin. Like, like uh, when you watch comedies, like it just it only makes sense, like, <laughs> like if these people are. That's why Big Bang worked because, like, Chuck actually wrote virgins and it made sense, like for like networks, <laughs> like sitcom characters. Like I was like, oh yeah, I believe you haven't had sex. The virgin thing, absolutely true. But I also think, obviously, those guys are leading men, but they're characters too, in yeah. a real way. And if you look at all, so many network shows where the leading man just just is weak chinned. I, you know what I mean? Yeah, like he's yeah. just, there's, oh, he has no terrified. choice, but they, in their effort to not offend anybody, the, the, the main guy is the most boring guy in the show. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. ugh, anyway. Oh yeah, no, it's rocky, <laughs> it's, it's rocky up here. <laughs> when you were developing Carmichael, did you test it and stuff? Were they, did they were there people turning dials or did you Yeah, they did, oh, it tested terribly. Like, of course, <laughs> it was terrible. Like, you get like, but again, like it's that, this uh, old way of thinking, yeah, you get a group of people in Vegas in a room and you give them the option to agree and disagree. <laughs> yeah. They're not writers, you hire a writer, have some courage to Take, take a chance, and that's why, that is the one benefit of like, you know, streaming or whatever, like broadcast, truthfully, they pay you, uh, they pay you that amount to cut your genitals off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever your genitals are, you cut them off. So what's the, the network version of Vita? Like, and and uh, is there a network version of Vita? Um, it's two tops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all tops. Yeah. No, but um, the sex would be just, I don't know if the sex would be there, especially the way we do it, you know? Um, it would be that and more like Latinx. I feel like sometimes uh, mainstream Latinx shows have to be v the most Latinx, you know? Oh, interesting. And it, it steeps itself in drama, but it's not a dramedy. You know, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's comedy, I guess. Um, but <laughs> but, it, but it, it, it probably would be funnier with more like jokes about our identity. It feels like, you know? But like we, we don't do 
any of that. The mm-hmm. insert punchline here. Yeah, insert punchline about identity, because the show is very oh. much steeped in identity. But Because right now, that's sort of what we've been allowed, you know? And when it sure. comes to comedy about Latinx, like, we've been allowed identity mm-hmm. theme stuff, yeah. you know? I can't wait to get past that, Beyond you know? That. But we don't have enough shows, Latinx yeah. theme shows on, on television, you know, for that yet. Severe mm-hmm. underrepresentation, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like for our show, it's not even an issue of subject matter. It's just an issue of pacing. Our show is very crazy where every one of the first three episodes is basically a different kind of show because it changes premises like mm-hmm. three times in the first three episodes. That's a spoiler, kind of, but not really. Um, so there's no way, I think, that, in my opinion, a network would be like, yeah, it's cool for it to be... Th- like the, the, the audience would have no idea what the show is until episode four, essentially. And then episode six has none of the main characters in it as well. So <laughs> it's really like out of the eight, eight episodes... It's, you just can't get a bearing on the show. And that's one of the things I love the most about it, which is that Amazon gave us a chance to do something that was super unpredictable. And in a world where I think a lot of times when, when they give you notes, they want the audience to know what the show is in the first five minutes or even the first minute. <laughs> you know, it's like someone comes up and is like, you know, your, your father died. Now we've got to move in together and get along. You know, it's something like that, right? It's like, that's yeah. what they that want at crazy. the beginning of everything. I mean, <laughs> I love we should, this is the writer's room for <laughs> that show. Who do you like for the father? Out of Bo yeah, Bridges. But sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Bo Bridges. But sometimes that kind of note, like to tell everything at the top yeah. makes you, like in the streaming shows or s- smaller amount of episodes, it makes you realize like, Oh no! Actually, the reveal is what you're doing, and you should. Ab- it it's reminds you to absolutely not do that. Right. Sure, right. absolutely. When was the last time you guys were completely wrong about viewers' sort of response to a scene, a character, um, something in your show? Uh, last season, we did a scene where um, uh, Barry um, he has this friend Chris, and and Chris. Um, knows about Barry's past and there's a scene in a car with him where we were writing it and got to a place where it's like, oh, he's going to have to kill this guy and this guy is just a, a nice guy with a wife and he's saying, I have a wife and I have a kid and, and then he realizes he said too much. He told Barry, I'm going to go to the cops and then he says, I'm not going to do that and he starts backtracking. And we wrote it and then we did it at the table read and there was that awful feeling where people laughed or laughed or laughed. That scene comes up and then there was just silence for the rest of the table read and Alec Berg and I are looking at each other like, okay, here it comes. And then HBO, we're like, great. That was great. <laughs> that is awesome. Like, don't change a word of that. So we shot it and then watched it. And then it was that thing where, you know, the post PA and the post coordinator come out. Like, I show up to work and they're like, hey, I watched that scene. <laughs> that was so sad. So we were kind of like, oh, this is where people are going to jump, jump ship. And instead, it was the polar opposite. People hmm. really res- responded to that. And so it was a good lesson, I think, for us of that, you know, that whole thing as a collective, they're genius. You know, the audience are really, could be really smart, you know, or they can, you know, they'll go with you, mm-hmm. you know, if it's coming, I think, from a genuine place. Yeah. We made a character have a taco, like just eat a taco, like a white girl on purpose. What does that mean? Like a sandwich. Ah, okay. And oh my God, Twitter, it was like, this show does not, how, I would never eat a taco. It was like, it became this thing. Well, this show, they don't even know how to eat tacos in the show. <laughs> it's not a legit Latina show. And it was like yeah. a choice because this girl's coming back. She's like, got bougie in Chicago. And she's like, <laughs> she's just like putting anything in the taco. And she races it to her. And it cost, and it was like, now we're, we have to deal with it in season two, why she eats tacos like that. But like, it was so unexpected. We couldn't shake it. Like, the huh. stigma of like, the show does not know. How dare how you? How dare you, you eat a taco like a sandwich, you know? I feel like I'm never gonna eat a taco in public. <laughs> <laughs> you come sort of to it. You come to it. You can't, it's not a sandwich. Mm, I've never had a taco, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're learning here, guys. <laughs> what do we have for lunch? <laughs> we can do a tutorial. <laughs> what about you, Allie? I, I think the episode we did that everyone really responded to was this fat babe pool party. Mm-hmm. And we went in thinking this is the episode people are going to like. Mm-hmm. And it, it was the one people talked Why about. Did you, what did you know about what you were hitting on? Just like seeing in bathing suits all these like different size bodies that you don't usually see. And also seeing her like have this whole awakening there. 
my God, it is so hot out here, but I'm not even mad about it, honestly. I'm just having so much fun. I'm having the time of my life. Good, that, that's what this is all about. I know, and like I've met so many people and I'm honestly thinking about buying a crop top, which I gotta say was not in the cards for me before, but I just gotta get in that pool. <laughs> When we filmed it, like, people in the crew were crying and people got really emotional. We have a funny thing on our show where the characters, and you may have a version of this as well, the characters are so horrible. I mean, there's no, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah. The characters are just despicable. But the actors and the actresses are quite likable, and that line gets very blurred for the audience because Selena is horrible, but Julia Louis Dreyfus is Elaine. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So and they they and so when she does the things that she's supposed to do, there is that initial like, oh my God, no, why? They don't want Elaine to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always like yeah. uh, they say like you know it's like oh Selena would make a great president. It's like you're wa been watching for <laughs> seven yeah. years. Yeah. She wouldn't. No. But I understand you would like Julia to be president. That's cool. But two separate things. Right. And they get very lost in that world. No, I've so had mean. someone come up to me at a, at a restaurant and say, I can't believe you made Henry Winkler right. like a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were like, that was, and they were, I thought it was a bit at first, and then I was like, that no, awful no, sinking no. feeling of like, oh, they're being serious. And they were holding my hand the whole time. <laughs> oh, oh, like I was shaking hands with them, and I was like, oh my gosh, you're really mad at me. Oh, you're not letting go of my hand. <laughs> 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 and this person was like, it was very uncool. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well. He's happy playing it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the paycheck, so he's good. Yeah. He's good. And your show, one of the things that, that I found fascinating is that you are a murderer, and yet the audience, in many ways, is, is rooting for you. And then all that's of a sudden, weird. Sally's character, a yeah. female, people don't get behind in the same well, way. Well, it's I'm funny. Curious. We had a, a screening of the first four episodes, and someone said, We've, I find her very unlikable, and someone shout out, Barry kills people. <laughs> <laughs> but what does she's that She's an say? ambitious actress, and she's not afraid to play someone is, who is complicated. They're not, a, I don't think, a bad person. She's just incredibly complicated. She's human. But this was always the thing on, on Breaking Bad, for yeah, instance. Yeah, that well, Skyler, we, people were just like, I yeah. can't stand Skyler, and you're like, And meanwhile, they're rooting for Walter White. <laughs> she's home alone with like a special needs kid and a baby, and she's the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then also, I've had people, Alec loves this, or, uh, of, Female reporter will say, "I don't. I've never found you attractive, but <laughs> you shooting people was very attractive. Ooh. Like you, the gun, I found rarely attractive. Oh. That's happened to me three times. And then Alec will always go, so wait, I want to back up. You've never found him attractive.' <laughs> <laughs> but how do you weird. respond to that? I don't know how to respond to that. I find it very strange. I find it. Well, I that's just a very weird thing. Three to say. times. Three it's times. happened three times. But you oh, married true. the third person. Yeah, yeah. The third person and I have real estate. We have multiple." <laughs> but it's weird. I don't know where it comes from. It's dangerous, like listening to Twitter and writing, yeah. and oh, people yeah. should do that. Like, it's like <laughs> I, I mean, good luck to anyone who wants to bear the cross of keeping Twitter happy and like representing. Well, Twitter like, is like, twenty-four like, hour a day audience testing. Because that's what we. That's talk, what it is. And, yeah. and when we talk about culture and people talk, we're talking about Twitter specifically. Mm -hmm. Twitter, like we we make it seem like it's in the air. No, it's it's <laughs> on Twitter. Twitter. Everyone's terrified of trending negatively. Everyone is afraid of like their at symbol and like what, <laughs> what people are saying and why did everyone has notes. One time I sent my mom uh, like a pilot and she was like, and I was like, tell me what you think. And she said, uh, well, you know, first I, I, I thought the lighting, I was like, I'm gonna stop you right there. <laughs> uh, you don't make television. You don't get to weigh in on what lighting? What are you doing? Like, I don't, like, I, that, that's yeah. not your, like, yep. how did it make you feel? That's very important. Did it give you the experience, the intended yeah. experience? That's very important. Like, you No, want because of the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Couldn't yeah. see anything. Yeah. I did a it's too dark. I used to do a character on SNL called Herb Welch, who was this old guy yeah. who hit people with a... Yeah, yeah, I love that. And this one guy um, from, I forgot where he was from, but he, he was like, worst character of the season, blah, blah, because on SNL, we would finish a show and everybody would be on their phones, not just on Twitter, but like, you'd be in the middle of a show and someone would be like, you know, Hitfix hated that sketch. I'm like, I'm getting out of the costume. Like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, the, like this is trendy. Like, this is yeah. trending. And I'm yeah. like, what is this? I just did it. You know yeah. what I mean? 
But this guy hated it, hated Hair Welch, hated Hair Welch, and then I, two years later, did a, he did an interview with me, and I'm like in my head going, like, oh, this is the guy, but I don't say anything. I'm like, whatever, you know. And then as he's leaving, like, can I tell you what character you did that I love? Herb Welch. And I go, okay, that's weird. Because <laughs> you specifically said you hated it. And he goes, oh, a friend of mine said that was lame and I should go back and watch him. So I did. And it was, it, they're funny. They're and I was like, <laughs> and, and, I was like and I'm like, he but, that? And he's like, you also look great shooting a gun. He's like, you also, you're kind of <laughs> really sexy now. shooting a gun. Yeah. Now, back then. But you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just fickle is well, what I'm I saying. Well, I want to see, have, have you ever read, there's a book, Difficult Men, and it talked about oh, like, yeah. the rise of yeah. those, those types of characters. People want interesting character. Yeah. Like, that, like that's, that's all there is. Sure. And someone being kind of fucked up is interesting. Lucy... <laughs> And I love Lucy. Lucy Arnaz is insane. She's an insane person who weekly sabotages her husband's life and career for personal yeah. gain. It, that's fucking. That's why it was interesting because well, she was so honest up. about it that people don't want to yeah. think about. Everyone is kind of on this road to like you know the road to happiness. Why does everybody always want to go to the road? Of unhappiness, you always make these weird choices. Ago, and people have been writing about that for well, but also it's like centuries. I don't know, you know any happy people. Yeah, yeah. I mean literally, yeah. I don't know. Sure. Any, I mean, my kids, I think, yeah. are happy. That's about it. Because they're dumb. Yeah. 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 They're yeah. not any better. They're not better. Don't, my kids are I don't happy. I know they're anyone stupid. that's happy. <laughs> <laughs> You guys have talked about sort of representation or underrepresentation. I'm curious, what are the worst cases of misrepresentation that you guys have encountered on television? That maybe they inspired you to do what you're doing, or maybe they just made you want to bang your head against a wall. I feel like misrepresentation is anytime you do representation for the sake of representation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you just start putting the United Colors of Benetton in your show, it, it doesn't reflect real life a lot of times. Like, like we have this tendency to paint this utopia that just doesn't exist. In Los Angeles, if you drive by any school, like high school being let out, you know you usually see the Asian kids with the Asian kids, the Latino kids with the you know, Latin kids, and the black kids with the black kids, and everyone kind of sticks in groups. And look, while I would like for there to be a, a meshing of all these cultures, that doesn't necessarily happen, and it's not true to a lot of people's experiences. Mm -hmm. And so when I see it on television, it just feels forced and contrived cosmetic. most of the time. Yeah. It feels very cosmetic, yeah. and I would much rather, like, you know, I, I did a show with an all-black family, I, and there were all black people in the pilot, right? I'm doing a, a show with uh, with Nate Bergazzi and, you know, it'll be a surprise to ABC. There should be all white people in the show. That's what, he, it's in Tennessee and a certain, that it makes sense to the show. Like Roseanne adding like the black kid, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> yep. Make another show about a black family mm -hmm. and Roseanne is a, that, that's not the existence. That's not the yeah. truth of her existence. Like, so anytime people lie for the sake of the trend, it bothers me. Sure. We did a shot. Uh, it's a commercial, a, a fake political commercial for Selena, where you see her in an office working, and we kind of united Benetton it up on purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's just her handing papers <laughs> to somebody, you know, in a headdress, and just a little bit of everything, yeah. just because it's so wrong the both the exploitation by her of it but also the fact that she just is probably casually racist in her own real life and you know and again it yeah. speaks to character but it, it's tough it's it's i mean i don't you know i have no great answers for it but i, I agree yeah, yeah i think people are yeah. looking for it too right it's like i did an interview once and they were like yeah your first show master nun you had all you talked about race a lot and then in forever it's like why don't you talk about race more it's like every show i have to do right. has to be about race yeah. I mean, that's yeah. insane it's because i'm asian like my show has to be about being asian it's like and by the way the show stars maya who's biracial yep. and fred who's a million different races <laughs> and it, just yeah. their existence by that very fact is like, okay, that's their right, people the fact in the world. That they're just playing those They're playing people. And no one is talking about, about it. it. Yes. And yeah. by the way, there's an episode, episode six, which is about a black man and an Asian woman falling and in love over the course of 30 years. And they do talk about race. I was like, is that not enough? The whole <laughs> show has to be like, it really was, it really opened my eyes to the expectations of, wow, you, you really think everything you ever work on has to be about that? It really doesn't. You know, it's, I'm happy to make more stuff. I'm making movies movie you that are. has an all yes. Asian cast, but... Mm -hmm. Not everything I do is going to be that. You but know? I think it's, that it's there is, the I mean, once you're in the door, perhaps you do feel a pressure, a pressure and responsibility. Uh, yeah. yeah, it does. Like hiring in my show Below the Line, too, like a lot of brown 
femmes, like it's important, you know, just because we haven't, like the, my cinematographer, as the first time she got a shot, like um, all my directors last season are Latinas, female, uh, most, including me, first time, a lot of us, you know? So like, it does feel like, okay, I got the and door then, open just for, I don't know how long I'm gonna have this door open, but for now, just go through, go through. It does feel, and, and then my people put that pressure too. They're like, yeah. Come, come on, you're in, so get me in. And it, it, it does feel that. And I, I maybe I should say no, maybe I should stop reading um, Twitter and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Trill is, is a show, I mean, a, a lot has sort of been made about the fact that we haven't seen these stories and, and a lead character like 80s on television before. What kind of added responsibility does that come with? Are those conversations you are having uh, in the writer's room? When we talk about different arcs for her life, there's like... Annie and family, Annie and work, Annie and friends, and one of them is Annie and her body. Mm -hmm. But it's like mostly her life isn't really about being fat. And I, I think I read that when you guys were pitching it, one of the things you made very clear was you didn't want it to be a show about a, a woman who gets on the scale in size. Yeah. What did that mean to you? What because would that it, have become, um, that show? Would become someone who wishes they were different than they were instead of realizing that they just want to be who they are. Uh -huh. Like anytime you're talking about would have her on the scale or talking about losing weight, you're saying she is not happy with who she is. I have to say, as a fat girl, um, that pool scene was so, and I'm a former fat actress, and I, you know, and I, I was on Hung and my name was Fat Woman Number One, um, oh. doing a fat, like all my characters for a long time were like, Big lady, fat, like they, the description, you know, and um, and then I left it because it was like I'm, I was okay with who I was, but like the industry hadn't, you know, like I couldn't play the lawyer yet. I can play it, you know, that kind of thing. But when I saw that, like I had to watch it twice. I'd never seen that imagery is so powerful, you know, like and and to get it right because it was the, the commentary was it wasn't about that. It was just her enjoying herself, being a, it's so it's so powerful, and I feel like hopefully it like will turn something, you know? Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I watched it with glee. David, I want to turn to you. What goes into trying to wrap up a show? What's that process? Are you looking at models? Are you, are you getting advice from people? And, and ultimately, how do you tune it all out and just nail it? I think I'm good at tuning it out. Uh, it's the opposite of when I joined the show. You know, when I took over for Armando, I guess... I'm not sure I quite realized the amount of noise about that happening until later on uh -huh. and sort of realized, oh, people were really, I don't know, expecting slash hoping it all went to hell. <laughs> and then we're pleasantly Who? surprised when people, it didn't. People in the involved in the show or outside I, of the show? There was show? something, I'll say the following, <laughs> and it makes me laugh. When the first reviews came out of my first shows, some of them... And I made the show, and I'm the first to tell you I think they're good. But some of the reviews were so crazily strong that it made you realize, oh, wow, their expectations were so low. They had, oh. they had already sort of pre-written the, this is a disaster, uh -huh. that they kind of, they're, they're like overselling like a bad movie yeah. that you go, your, your expectations are so low, and you're like, Let's, it's actually kind of good. Yeah, they, they were kind of a little crazy. I think they were good, but some of the reviews. So, I don't know, you kind of, you get used to that. That being said, uh, I lived through the end of Seinfeld, and so I'm aware that, and I'm seeing it as this season sort of unfolds even, which is we've been playing a lot with like the Dan and Amy relationship. And again, the, the I guess the, the, the fans, their visions of this beautiful marriage between these two horrific people that just is never going to happen. <laughs> and I don't know how else, I always say like, when you get to the end of it, I think it's a really, it is the ending that makes sense. It is the logical ending. I've joked it's the ending that America deserves. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I really feel, I, I have felt good about it since, like, I had it. Leon? Yeah. I'm still, I'm not sure about this part where I say I want to be president for all Americans. I mean, do I? You know, mm -hmm. all of them. How about real Americans? Oh, yeah, that's good. And okay. then we can figure out what I mean later. Yeah. Ma'am, I don't have a copy of the speech. Okay, I don't know what she's saying, so here. Ma'am, the, the, the voters need to know clearly and definitively why you want to be president. In your own words. If you want me to use my own goddamn words, then write me something to say, okay? Yes, ma'am. Oh, and take out the stuff about immigration, because I feel like it's a little too issue -y. Okay. There was a point 
where the show is going to shoot earlier yes. than obviously it ultimately did, care of Julia's health. And you went back in and and rewrote or reframed that well, season. Politics was just, I mean, our background of politics was just changing. The the, the norms have gone out the window. How so? You know, so the, no, no, <laughs> interesting fact. Um, yeah, so it just all of these things that were kind of the... I don't know, the Veep bread and butter just were pointless. Like so many. What does that mean? Well, like for example, so many of the episodes, if you look back on the first, you know, I don't know, even six seasons, have her at some point kind of giving a speech and really screwing up in the speech and paying the price, losing some sense of whatever it was she wanted. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. What, what that seems no. like from the no. 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. notion that her staff is so spectacularly incompetent that you can't believe these people yeah. are working in Washington. I mean, so a lot yeah. of these things, and by the way, just even, and, and this is connected to that first one, just the notion of sort of like, that there's a price to pay for anything, it just, and, and even the notion of like this is what politicians are behind are like behind closed doors. There are no closed doors. Yeah, right. So it was just a chance to just go. Oh my God! Like, like I think our stories are overall sound, but the the, the details. The, the when you go in with the paintbrush, I, it just everything has changed, and you have to reflect this. You have to find a way. Sure. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Where like you just kind of go, oh, my show's set in New York, and now New York doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how mm -hmm. else to explain it. Yeah, yeah. real or life gets in the way. Leave it to Beaver came out after the civil rights movement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, or like, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, after having an experience of writing for your own character, now you are working with someone who is sort of telling his story, and mm -hmm. it's a world that, that's different from your world. What has that process been like for you? What are the pieces of, of your own world, and, and perhaps it's the religion piece, and perhaps it's other pieces that you've tapped into to tell his story? Uh, yeah, I, I, really my, my role, I, I think, as a producer is to run block. Mm -hmm. You know, that's pretty much what I'm there for. That and to uh, be a dick on marketing calls. I uh, get <laughs> really upset and, and marketing is, for comedy specifically, is very difficult. It's a difficult task to make your characters not look like fucking idiots. <laughs> what, what does that look like in Rami's case? Sometimes. No, no, that's a fight, <laughs> is what it looks like. It looks like a fight to Yeah, get people don't there. realize the amount of calls and fights you get oh. to get a poster for and a marketing, comedy mar that has, that's not like... It's the, <laughs> it's, the, it's the fastest moving piece of it. Everything else moves slower. Marketing moves very quickly. And it's this unfair battle where you don't have control of the assets. When you're creating a show, you control the asset, the, what you write, what you direct. But you control that in marketing. It's a it's a lot of you know the illusion of collaboration with forty posters they have ready to be put up in Cincinnati. <laughs> you know, like right. oh, this key art that you disagree with, like that. But I'm there for that, and I'm there <laughs> really to make sure that he stays true to himself and that he doesn't hide any of that truth. You know, whatever that means, and just to remind him that, like, you know, his parents' judgment on the show shouldn't affect his writing. You know, uh -huh. like, it, like you have to write from your own truth. And it's, again, Twitter's judgment of the show, it, and yet you can't write from that place. Otherwise, you're just, you're writing in a box, in a bubble, and you are, you've begun an impossible task. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's, I'm just there to, as a reminder of that. And it's also important to refine the universality in, in subjects that can feel very, very specific. And I know in his case, I mean, mm -hmm. That is a very sort of specific take. What, um, how have you sort of tried to use your own experiences to, to draw out uh, the stories he wants to tell? A lot of times it's as simple as if something's based on reality, hear the story and then see what's being written on the page mm -hmm. and see where we've lost the honesty. <laughs> Like, see where we've lost tension, see where we've lost, like, the things that makes the situation interesting to begin with. A lot of times we, even as creators, have a tendency to protect stories, and in that protection we lose a lot of the interesting elements that make it a worthwhile story to begin with. Mm. Like, in what sense protect it? Um, protective wear, you know, oh, my mom did this to me, but that makes her look a little too oh. rough. Mm. So we'll make it, you know, she hit me with, you know, a pillow instead of an ashtray. Yeah. Bro, what are you wearing, bro? What? What is this? I mean, seriously, you look like Muammar Gaddafi. 
it's a Galabia, bro. I, I mean, I, I know it's a Galabia. I love Galabia. So nobody's talking about the Galabia. I'm talking about you in this Galabia. It's a little bit short. It's, right, a little bit it's, it's an old walk. like a Muslim mini skirt for a man. I mean, it's really too much. Why are you wearing a tracksuit? It looks dope. Don't be jealous, okay? Run DMC, baby. Run DMC all day. You look like a Russian basketball coach. Leave my tracksuit out of this. I think I look good. This yeah. season on the Barry, all the characters are trying to fight their nature and just be honest and truthful, but some of the characters, what they're realizing is that's not what this town wants because that doesn't make a lot of money. <laughs> you know what I mean? It makes people feel bad. You know? It, the thing we keep saying is people go, that was a bummer. Yeah. That's what everyone says when they see the honest thing. Yeah. And, and it's funny because Steven Root's character, Fuchs, is just this hitman kind of, he's like my hitman agent guy, just dummy. He's like, people don't want that. He's the one telling me. He's like, people just want Braveheart. They want that speech from Braveheart. <laughs> you think that guy actually gave that speech in Braveheart? No, of he just fucking not. died. <laughs> <laughs> but you see it, and it's like the greatest thing you've ever seen, yeah, right? Yeah, so don't worry. Yeah. don't worry about being honest. Because yeah. being honest just makes you vulnerable and scared, you know? It, but it does, I mean, I, 100% on the bummer thing, but I I don't even think it has to be about the bummer thing. I remember back in the Seinfeld days, the way we would hire writers was just lists of ideas. It was it was incredible because you'd look through that list of ideas and you'd go, no, 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 no. These were all terrible. These were, there was there was one idea that was pitched over and over and over again that was the, about the worst idea I've ever heard, which was constantly George dates a transvestite but doesn't know. That was <laughs> that was every terrible writer's like George idea. Yeah. But you would read through the list and then you'd get down to one and you would go, like this story argument about a, uh, an argument in a stereo store. That happened, didn't it? And they would be like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's, it your, only, it's your only your only good idea no. on the list. Yeah. Yeah. Mine yeah. your life. Yeah. Just yeah. mine your life. Yeah, yeah. people and don't like, yeah, they don't want to no, do that it, it, because it, it's But boring. it doesn't have to be yeah. terrible. They don't have to be bummer ideas. No. But the reality of this is a crazy thing that you got into, it, it speaks to something. And on Veep these days, it's a little harder to do that, but there are things in Veep that are universal, like bad bosses and those kinds of things. And you know, you can still take those things from your life. But again, I think it's what we've been talking about all day, which is truth. It just yeah, I think truth, truth is yeah. the hardest thing to. And like every time you say we're going to do the truth, there is a moment of like, okay, we're going to we're going to do this, guys. We're going to say this. You know, we're, everybody's cool with this. You know, and without being pretentious, that's being an artist. I mean, that's like why you want to create. Be, but that's why you want to create and do it, this stuff. But they can know? be silly ideas yeah, too, right. silly right. true ideas. But again, they they sparkle because they were. It's the tincture yeah. of reality. It's like yeah. the audience can tell. It's just yeah. Like you could, oh, did that really? You could just tell. And it's something about the details. Details matter. You're not it's trying like to sell me on something. Exactly. exactly. But, again, on but something. the truth. It's of the pain of it as well mm -hmm. is but important. Pain is yeah, like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, not, but, yeah. but it's that thing that I've, I've seen extracted so much. Even like comedians with like jokes and things on stage and situations. Like, tell me about the pain of your experience. Show me the, you know, show me the lowest moment. Show me the most tense moment. The moment worthy of like asking for people's time to watch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're gonna say about what's the bad TV version of Barry. We always said was like it's a very glib show about death, mm -hmm. and you treat the murders as a glib thing. And I think when it was announced, and I would say, oh, I'm doing this show about a hitman who wants to be in acting class. They're like, oh, all right, I know what that's gonna be bad. That's hilarious. You know? <laughs> uh, and he's gonna be like, weekend at Bernie's type stuff, like the dead body. He's like, those are my brother. You know, oh man, I love it. You know, and you're like, no, <laughs> no, it's not. not what it is gonna be at all. <laughs> And you're like, no, no, it's going to be about how you perpetrate violence that destroys your soul. Yeah. And it, like, makes you, like, not want to live anymore. It's a bummer. Yeah, and you go, that's the what yeah. this guy, and we it's talk to people, yep. and that's what happens. Right. All right, I want to touch on, on where we are in, in the industry right now, where I think everyone at the table has had to fire their agents. Um, and I want to ask the question that I think is being asked sort of around town without any judgment, which is, why do you need an agent? And is that a question you guys have been asking yourselves? I, I mean, I really like my agent a lot. <laughs> yeah, I and, like yeah, Josh Katz just went, his ears are burning yeah, right now. I, He's at the desk. He just went, ow, what? Wait. Yeah, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I fired her or if we just switched to cell phone calls. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah. you know, I Did you send the letter? Uh, no. Oh, I'm sure. not gonna lie to you. I didn't and I should have <laughs> and I just haven't. And I hope they work this thing out. I really do. I think it's really important and I think, you know. You know, I, I just think it's something that, like, 
I need more understanding on exactly yeah. what's happening. Not at the like, agents. It's the agency and the practices, right? I mean, like, I adore my agent. I wouldn't be here, you know? He plucked me out from the off-off Broadway show that, you know, I was doing, and then he, you know, he brought me over here, basically. I, I owe him a lot. I love him. But it's the eight. It's the practices, right? It seems like, if I understand the it packaging. correctly, the pack and everything else, uh, and and there's a lot of anxiety. Everybody needs some CBD right now, <laughs> and I feel like we're just holding on for the ride. Because most people I know love their agents, but these practices are gnarly. So, like, yeah, I don't. I at the initial question of like, like, could you do it without your agent? Like, in my experience, I like as far as my TV work like I would never have met the people yeah. that I met without them yeah, I met putting Alec everyone together agent. yeah like it like started all every relationship that I now can get jobs without them were started because of, of them right and I think people you know who aren't at this table who aren't running shows and hiring people it's that's more scary. difficult yeah, right? yeah. 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 that's, that's, that's right. it's hiring Enjoy, season right? yeah. and, and you're a young writer coming up yeah. that's when it really hurts you yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. that being said I, I support the writers guild and i hope we can work this out but but certainly um, you know that's when you need the, the agent the most i think yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's i of course hard. support the 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 guild <laughs> and i mean they have i think the best health insurance and it's fantastic <laughs> and i love it oh. and i think they're great however i you know it's disruptive to, you know, halt certain collaborative efforts, and so you just wanted to. I feel like the allowances on eyeglasses could be better. <laughs> <laughs> talk about That's that your bill, right? I have a pretty terrible prescription, yeah. and I find it doesn't cover. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what is your most unusual pre-writing ritual? I'm constantly pacing the entire time, and I'm also the board guy. So I'm always writing on the board. And then we moved to another studio, and I was pacing, and I went, and I got lost. <laughs> I went to another room. You travel. No, I'm, like, pacing, like, looking down at the ground, and I, I, I never stop moving. That helps me, too. I'm, yeah. I always walk around the writer's room, and, you know, our writer's room for forever is really small, and so yeah, was, I'm sure it was so annoying, but I'm, like, I'm walking behind, it's like, Everybody I get to do it because I'm the boss. My, <laughs> my, my friend it's said really it's good. like Untouchables with Al Capone when he's walking around. <laughs> I'm so afraid so you're going to hit me with a baseball bat because I'm just <laughs> pacing around in but the I'm, circle. Yeah, but on I, Parks and Rec, you hurt your foot I, and that you were on a very ironic scooter. Sort of yeah, punishment. Yeah. But, but yeah, we're even, still scooting around. Yeah, but when I, you know, when I when I was writing this movie, I did the same thing. But I did it in New York City, so I, no one could stop me. So I would walk from my apartment on like Houston to like the Met, which is like eighty blocks away. And yeah, I would just, for some it's just reason, getting away from your computer and getting away from your phone. I used to work on South Park, and Trey yeah. Parker would do that. He never stopped moving, and he would like go off into another room. Maybe that's where we got it because yeah. I worked there briefly too. Yeah. I saw him do the yeah, same he would thing. Just it was walk really, in circles. Yeah. What are the wild things you guys do? Um, when I start a room, like before, the day before, I always, I always bring my bruja to <gasps> clean it and tell me what spirits are in there. And we're going to be okay. I really do do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that wins. There we go. Um, you win. That's a great answer to the question. <laughs> I, am a, I have learned no lessons in life. I was a college student that wrote my papers the night before. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, whatever the hell, 30 years later. How you guys do that? Oh, my I would God. Be, I would blow No, I calculate <laughs> if they're due at 10 a.m., then I will sit yeah. down and start and writing at 7 a.m. Yeah, exactly. And see if I, I can. don't know how in my head. Just you saying it makes me. Yeah. Yeah. The ships the burning behind me create the adrenaline. That's how SNL people people do yeah. that they would wait like yes, like no. Seth Meyers wouldn't start writing until 4 a.m. Yeah. No, AD no. does everything right away. Yeah, I'm and that way. I always thought it was the I would walk out thing. at 11 p.m. on SNL and it was like, where are you going? And I'm like, I finished right. I'm going home. <laughs> they're like, oh, it's 11. And they're like, people haven't shown up yet. Why are you not sleeping here? <laughs> um, what about the film or show that made you want to do what you're currently doing? I feel like Laverne and Shirley is what has always motivated me, combined with Little House on the Prairie. Which one had that sign? Uh, that sign off, like "Good night, Mister," uh, and he would go like, "Yeah, uh, just go, make uh, the same. Uh, yeah, right. was that Cheers? I think that was at the end of Cheers. Okay, okay, I yeah, can't remember. Yeah, I think. that's one of the yeah, best. That was really yeah. <laughs> when I was pretty young, my dad let me watch Taxi Driver, mm -hmm. and there was a moment it's in tight. Taxi Driver where he's on the phone, where he's just taking Sybil Shepherd to a um, porno movie, and it's like. 
the worst thing. And embarrassment is such a huge thing when you're a kid. And I was like watching, I was so embarrassed. I was like, I can't believe he did that. And he's on the phone with Sybil Shepherd, and he's like, oh, did you get my flowers and everything? And you could tell she's turning him down. And as she's doing it, the camera just dollies off of him and it goes down a hallway. And it was this thing unlocked in my brain at like 11 or whatever of like, oh, the movie doesn't want to watch this. Oh. I was like, the filmmaker doesn't wow. want to watch this. And I was like, oh, you can do that. You can have like a subjective huh. thing. Mm -hmm. And ever since that moment happened, I've just been obsessed with movies. And also when he shoots Harvey Keitel and the camera's across the street and he leaves, it taught me about point of view, where mm -hmm. it's like you're the point of view of the person from the stoop across the street mm -hmm. and you're just watching. And then the guy sits down. Now it's just you and him sitting there and you're like, why does that work? And, and you just start asking yourself those questions. And that was the movie that did it for me. Yeah. I, I think very similarly, it was, you know, for forever, the inspirations that we talked about were David Lynch, uh, Mulholland Drive, and Blue Velvet and uh, Racerhead, and then uh, Vim Vendors also, which is oh, Paris, man. Texas, and it just Paris, very, Texas. I mean, is and huge. like we're gonna make this. Obviously, Maya and Fred are two of the funniest people in the world, and it's gonna be funny. We're gonna write funny stuff for it, but can we do something that evokes, you know, that atmosphere and, and that kind of world? And then I think in general, um, you know, in the mood for love, the Wong Kar Wai movie, and then Seinfeld also, which I liked watching. Growing up, so <laughs> you weren't there alone. You yeah, yeah. You weren't two the only one two, on that. Two very different influences. <laughs> yes. but yeah. no, that's where good stuff comes yeah. from. Yeah. 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 You know, but you don't yeah. know that like, it comes from yeah, that either. Like, like you don't know yeah. when you're writing we're writing Barry and it isn't mm -hmm. until like we're sitting there watching it in the edit bay where I'm like, Oh, this is kinda like taxi driver. You yeah. know what I mean? You were catching the taxi driver when you were a kid and you yeah. never forgot that yeah. moment. It's it, like, like that's deep seated in you sure. someplace. Yeah. It's like a musician going like, Oh, this is like the Beatles. Yeah. And some kids gonna <laughs> some kid's gonna make a movie that combines Barry with some crazy hologram thing that happens yep. like 20 years from now, yeah. right? And he won't know. He'll be yeah, like, that's yeah. insane. Well, I think we've done it. Thank you guys all for being here. Thank you. I like how you kept it moving. We're Thank you. Yeah. We're, We're proud of you. <laughs> you ran this room. Hi, I'm Tanya Saracho. Hi, I'm Alan Yang. I'm Allie Rushfield. Hi, I'm Bill Hader, and thanks for watching. Thanks for watching The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter Roundtables. Roundtable on YouTube. On YouTube. Hi, everyone on YouTube. Ha, 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 ha.